Welcome to the screencast for A Theory of Justice and Distributive Justice. A Theory of Justice is by John Rawls, and Distributive Justice is by Robert Nozick. You can find the first article on page 541 in our textbooks. This one's going to take a little bit of background information. We're starting a new unit again, and this it's called Social Justice in our textbook, but it's really usually classified as political philosophy. And what political philosophy does is it looks at questions and problems of forming governments. How should we organize them so the most people that we can get to prosper? What's justice? What does it mean to implement it? How do we distribute wealth? What about taxation, regulation, freedom, power? Uh, these are some of the core issues that political philosophers study. Now, in Western political philosophy, there have been two competing frameworks. One of them emphasizes individual freedom, where everybody should have the most amount of rights and abilities to do whatever they want without government interference. Uh, that should be the bedrock of society in the first framework. In the second framework, the equality or social welfare of all of the citizens taken together should be the bedrock of society. If you think about it, why these two are opposites, it's because anytime you, you put into place regulations on how wealth is distributed or um, who can get what kinds of power or who is in charge of whom, then you're taking away the individual freedom of at least some part of the citizenry. So we've been looking at moral theory for a while, and we looked at Kantianism and utilitarianism specifically. Remember that Kantianism looks at internal motivations when you act out in the world. It doesn't matter what the consequences are of your actions, as long as you have the right kind of motivation, you are a moral person. And remember that utilitarianism looks at the consequences. Uh, so you want to figure out the most utility that you can get of any action or set of actions when you have rule utilitarianism. So each of those claim that they are capturing something important about what it means to be moral. Likewise, in political theory, some argue that individuals should retain as much power over themselves as possible, and others say that the welfare of the majority matters more than any individual. So, of course, these principles often clash. When there's lots of free choice and little regulation, the distribution of wealth and other social goods, some of them are listed here, education, access to jobs, clean environments, health care, quality housing, it usually becomes skewed over time. Individual choices can add up to massive inequality, but if you're emphasizing individual rights, the government has very little power to stop you from living however you want to live. The advocates of equality, on the other hand, think that it's part of the government's job to protect its citizens. That's uh, part of the social contract. We're going to talk about that more, I promise, but in the next one. Um, so the reason we give the government any sort of power whatsoever uh, and let it take away some of our rights, let us let them put us in jail or tax us, etc., uh, is because they're supposed to protect us. And some people think that part of that role of protection is to ensure that every person when they're born has a roughly equal chance to succeed. So in this case, the government has to interfere with individual freedom because only regulation can ensure this kind of access to equal opportunity. Now, both of these schools of thought are what's called classically liberal. So I know that today uh, in our contemporary culture, liberal means Democrat or left, and conservative means right, uh, and it's generally thought of as the opposite of liberal. But classical liberalism has its roots 
in the word liberty. Um, and it has roots in the Enlightenment. It means that you're an advocate for liberty for all. So the people who fight on the side of equality as being the bedrock of society think that we'll get more liberty if we ensure equality. Whereas the people who are more for individual rights think we're freer if we have less regulation. So individual human rights personal freedom, and the right to have power or autonomy over your own body, life, and choices. These are the tenets of classical liberalism, uh, which both, again, conservatives and liberals of today have as the core of their belief system. Uh, before classical liberalism came into the philosophical conversation, so before Locke, Kant, Hobbes, Rousseau, uh, the liberty of the individual person to own private property or choose where to live just wasn't even thought of, wasn't talked about. People were accepted, or supposed to accept the power of the state, and that's it. You can think that there were monarchies and serfdoms. You were born into a system, and you were slotted into a role, and that's it. So we can still sort of see this this push and pull in the Republicans and Democrats today for all whatever flaws we have, and they are numerous. Democrats generally advocate for greater equality, while Republicans generally want smaller government and more individual freedom. Uh, our Constitution and American ideals all come from the ideals of classical liberalism, where people have the right to decide how they want to live. So I have Payne, Jefferson, Hamilton. These are the guys that codified or wrote down uh, the tenets of classical liberalism first. Now, John Rawls is a classical liberal, uh, classically liberal theorist, but he also came up with some ideas to try and get the best of both worlds, sort of. Ensure that we have as much equality as possible while still promoting as many individual rights as we can. So it wants to take into account both individual freedom and equality. And I know I've said this before, and it's a survey introductory class, so I'm definitely gonna show you the highlights, but John Rawls has had such a massive influence on many different academic fields from political science, political philosophy, economics, um, government, international relations. He wrote his works mostly uh, starting in, from the 1970s up until uh, he passed away in the late uh, 20th century. But his work is still a central part of the discourse in political philosophy today. So A Theory of Justice is the name of a book he wrote, and this is a sh very short excerpt. Um, and here is a quote from the introduction to Rawls that Stephen Kahn put in our textbook. Rawls contends that the fairest way to distribute goods is in accord with principles that everyone would accept regardless of the abilities they happen to possess, or the social and economic circumstances in which they find themselves. So, and Rawls in his book is looking for these principles. What are principles of justice that everyone could accept despite their differences? That's the goal of this part of the paper. He gives us a thought experiment, uh, which is a little bit intricate, but uh, it tries to show that when you strip away all of the things that make us unique and we're left with just what makes us rational human beings, there are two principles of justice that everyone would agree to. So the thought experiment is about the original position and the veil of ignorance. Okay, so what is it that every person has in common? And what is it that makes us different to one another? Well, according to most of Western history, we are all rational as people and we're all self 
self-interested or self-motivated. We want to get the things we need to stay alive and we want to get the things to make us happy. So we're going to use our reason uh, to further our self-interest. Uh, we're self-interested in so far. We want to get these things we need and desire to live our best lives. So every single human being has both of these characteristics. And every other thing is what makes us different to one another and creates our individual goals and desires. And these things include our personal traits. So are we intelligent? Are we strong? Are we healthy both mentally and physically? Our place in society, when we're, are we born rich? Are we born poor? What country are we from? What city, what region? Our social identities, like our skin color, gender, religion, and sexuality. These are the things that make us different and create our individual goals and desires. So if we were all gonna sit down and figure out principles of justice, we would be arguing for things that would help people like us because we're self-interested. So we need to strip those away if we want everything to be fair. And that's the original position. It's the bare, rationally self-interested group of people with all of those differing traits stripped away. So we're put underneath a veil of ignorance. We don't know if we're men, women, Chinese, South African, from the United States. We don't know if we are prone to illness or if we're strong, if we're good at math or we're good at sports. Uh, we don't know if we're born into a wealthy family or a poor family. So there's some magic that puts us all in a room and nobody knows these differing characteristics. But we still retain our ability to be self-interested and to re use reason to try and further our self-interest. But if we're all exactly the same, what would we come up with as our principles of justice? Well, if you didn't know anything about who you are or who you would be in this new society, you would want a system of laws and governance that was as fair as possible for everybody. Because once the veil of ignorance is lifted, you could be black, white, male, female, poor, rich, sickly, healthy, etc. You don't know. Uh, so you would want as much equality as possible because you could end up as a CEO or you could end up homeless. You don't know. And if you ended up on up as the worst off member of society, you would want that worst off member of society to be at least minimally protected. So Rawls argues that any group of rationally self-interested persons in the original position would come up with two basic roles, rules for government. Uh, the first is equality in the assignment of basic rights and duties. Uh, let's see where we are. Page 632. Oh, uh-oh, I should have changed that. That was the fifth edition. So this actually is on page 543. And the first one is, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive scheme of basic equal liberties compatible with a similar scheme of liberties for others. Okay, so that means you have the most individual rights to your freedom as possible. That's compatible with every single person having those exact same rights. So that's... Uh, like the right to vote, the right to run for office, the right to uh, not be stolen from, the right to property. All these rights of non-interference from other people. And the second one is social and economic inequalities are just only if they result in comp compensating benefits for everyone, in particular the least advantaged members of society. So equality is allowed because we want incentives. Once we're, the veil of ignorance is lifted, some people are cleverer uh, and they'll invent new medications or technology. Some people are more ambitious, so they're more likely to create jobs or uh, get wealth and put it back into the community. 
So you want to be, you want to motivate people that have these kinds of traits, but you want to motivate them only just enough to make sure they complete these tasks. Uh, we want to make sure that whoever invents that medicine, that the person who needs it, that least well-off person will be able to get it. So if doctors and what they do benefit the least well-off in society, we should compensate them for that. It's like uh, rising tide floats all boats. But you should only pay them just enough so they'll complete that task that will help everybody. No more. In, in that way, there won't be such extreme wealth diversity or wealth inequality. So, of course, the first principle aims at making society as equal as possible, for while the second allows for as much individual freedom as possible, as long as it doesn't interfere with equality. Okay. Rawls recognizes that our identity markers are, are valuable to what we see as a good life, and we should be able to use them to improve our, our individual lots in life and opportunities for the rest of society. So I have their max minning. All that means is we want to create a set of laws or contexts or social norms in the world, policies, I guess is a good catch-all name, wherein we maximize the position of the least well-off in society. So if you think about what makes someone not well-off, they don't have money, they don't have access to education, their lives might be violent, they don't have access to health care or jobs. This person who's the least well-off, we want to maximize the basic rights that and uh, human goods that they have because that means everybody is guaranteed to have at least those basic human goods. So when we're stripped of identifying markers, whether they're accident, where you, you happen to be born into the dominant socioeconomic class, accidents of genetics, you happen to be born smarter or stronger or faster, this doesn't mean that everyone is not equal morally, because everyone's a human being and they all deserve moral respect. And no one has more entitlement to basic moral goods than anyone else because of these accidents. Okay, I said some of this already. <laughs> uh, so you can use it to review. But I'll point out the last part of this slide. The first principle is prior to the second, which means that any advantage of a single person or group of persons have can never violate individual human liberties. So remember, we're allowed to have a little bit of inequality as incentive for people to create new things that will help everybody. But that can never happen if it requires that individual human rights are violated. That's more important. Okay, so the next article is directly after this on page 545. I guess before I get into this, I want to have a segue where I say, okay, if we had uh, Rawls' Two Principles of Justice implemented, and we re rewrote all federal laws to reflect this idea. Uh, it would mean for us to get there from where we are that we would probably have to redistribute wealth um, because there are people that are so poor that, again, they can't afford, afford health insurance, they can't afford rent on an apartment or new clothes, or and they don't have a permanent address, so they can't get a job. And those are probably the least well-off people in our society. And if we wanted to raise their status to the point where they had all their basic needs met, we would have to redistribute wealth from the wealthiest down to the least well-off. And Nozick 
has an argument against that. He doesn't think distributive justice is a neutral term. He thinks people are entitled to the holdings or goods and wealth that they've earned with their own bodies and labor. Um, he doesn't know if there should be any redistribution of goods. Uh, there might be a reason to redistribute goods, but we can't just assume that we should take the goods from the wealthy and give them to the poor. We need a standard if we want to figure out any kind of redistribution in a just way. He says that if you live in a free society, people have differing access to various resources. And the way you get the resources that you want is to voluntarily exchange them with other people in the free society. He says that there's no central distribution, no person or group that's entitled to control all the resources, jointly deciding how they're going to be doled out. And of course, you can argue with this. You can argue with Rawls. Um, you can argue with the statement before that, that freedom means that there will always be differing access to the most basic goods of human life. But according to, to Nozick, if we're going to decide the distribution of resources, if it's fair or not, we have to keep in mind that this is a distributed individual transaction system, not a centrally determined system. And these individual dispersed interactions is where the justice or injustice of wealth holdings comes into the picture. He asks who's entitled to what. And Nozick says it depends on the type of transaction. Uh, first, you might originally acquire holdings, and that just means wealth or goods or lands, um, capital. The transfer of holdings is another type of transaction. You already have the wealth or goods or capital, and you give them to somebody else in exchange for something. And then the repeated interaction of those two things. And if all three of those transactions are just, continuing to hold whatever resources you have is justified. You could also uh, put a counterpoint in here. This might lead to resource hoarding. Uh, while Rawls was trying to merge individual liberty and inequality, Nozick is of the opinion that individual liberty should be fought for at all costs and that the government only has legitimate power in the most barest, minimal sense as possible. If Nozick's views on holdings are accurate, justice is historical. So when we look at people who have massive wealth now, and we have to trace back to how they originally got their resources, or how those resources came into their family originally, maybe, uh, to see whether or not the original acquisition of the wealth was just. It depends on what actually happened. He, he notes at the end of the section, the entitlement theory, that if the holdings are unjust, the situation should be rectified, but it's too complex of a topic to talk about in this short excerpt, and it's not the focus. Now he says why he thinks um, any sort of law or rule or norm that's put into place to try and keep things more or less equal can never be free, it can never be a society based in liberty. And he gives us a thought experiment involving a famous professional basketball player. At the time he was writing it, it was Wilt Chamberlain. But we can say LeBron or Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan. Um, so you could say at the beginning, 100,000 or a million people have the exact same amount of money. And they all buy a ticket to go see 
their favorite basketball player play. The tickets are all the same amount of money. They all spend 20 bucks. Um, already, wealth is getting concentrated at the, the stadium or the arena. And then when the game's over, uh, all the players have a bucket next to them. And you can go and tip them if you really enjoyed watching them. And most people decide to go and, and tip their favorite player who accumulates $100,000 or $50,000 in one night in this way. So you can see the beginnings of wealth inequality. But people voluntarily did it. They were free to take their resources and give it however they wanted to. And they chose to give it to somebody who provided entertainment for them. So an end state principle or a distributional, distributional pattern of justice can't be maintained without interfering with people's liberty. Uh, so when you think about both Nozick and Rawls, I'd like you to think about how Rawls tries to be a hybrid, a political system that protects liberty without sacrificing notions of the common good. And Nozick thinks, well, okay, the common good is important, but it, it's up to individuals to decide what that means, because individuals are always primary. Um, neither are without their flaws, of course. I would like you to think about what issues both of uh, these philosophers' theories could run into if we tried to actually implement them in the real world.